Okay, good morning, everyone. Let's go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us today for this Emerging Market Opportunities for Air to Water Heat Pumps um, with John Siegenthaler. You wanna go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, today's presenters, um, you'll have myself as a moderator. My name is Carly. I do marketing and events here at Intertech. You will also have Tim Wright, VP of Sales for, at Intertech, Jeff Hammond, who is also um, the Vice President of Technical Services at Intertech, and John Siegenthaler of Appropriate Designs. To get the most out of this webinar, we encourage you to take notes. We will be sharing a recording after the webinar. Um, John will be covering a lot of topics and um, there will be a lot of detail in this. So if you miss anything, don't worry about it. We will be sending it out after um, via email. And then if you guys have any questions during this webinar, if you go to your control panel, there is a questions tab. You can go ahead and type in your questions and then underneath that will be a polls question to where we will ask questions throughout the webinar and you guys can put your answers in and then we can share it for the group. And then, like I said, if you guys have any questions, feel free to put them in. We will try and get to them all at the end. If time does not allow, we will reach out directly to you guys. Okay. Tim, I'll pass it over to you. Thanks, Carly. Appreciate uh, everybody taking time to join us today. This is an exciting opportunity to have John Siegenthaler with us. And then we also have Jeff Hammond, our Vice President of Technical Services with us today too, to help answer your questions as we head toward the end of this time together. But very exciting time in the life of Entertech to offer this emerging market opportunities to air to water heat pumps. And today we're just really gonna have John start to unpack for us the opportunity that I, I still believe many of us don't realize is there and prevalent in the marketplace today, like it has been in Europe for a number of years. So it's gonna be an exciting time today. John's gonna to share an awful lot uh, with regards to just where are we with this emerging technology? And then next Tuesday, John's also gonna get into system details for us on air to water heat pumps. And then the following Tuesday, I think you're catching the theme every Tuesday for the next four weeks. Then John's going to take us through retrofitting, which I think is a wonderful opportunity for all HVAC as well as the, the plumbing industry, boiler people as well, is how do we take it to that next level with many, many homes and buildings that need to be retrofitted and heading toward electrification. And then lastly, John will finish up on February the 16th with example systems. And again, Jeff Hammond will be joining us uh, for all of these events as well. So, John, we are so excited to have you with us today. I mean, you are certainly the leading expert in this market area. Uh, so if you don't mind advancing that next slide for us, we'll keep rolling. Thanks, so a little Jeff. bit on, on Entertech, if I may, and really from the standpoint of, of you know, where we are today, a lot of people in the industry will say, well, aren't you a geothermal manufacturer? And the answer is yes. We're very, very good with geothermal. Uh, that's, that's been where we uh, had our beginning in 1996. The company actually began at, at Steve and Karen's kitchen table. And that's really where this journey began. So come to about June of 2021, we'll be celebrating our 25th anniversary at Entertech. So, so much to be thankful for grateful for but a lot of it has been on geothermal and water source heat pump and as you fast forward you know you'll see in the timeline 2014 um, you know Entertech was purchased by Neba Industrier based out of marketed Sweden and they are a wonderful company so far advanced with air to water heat pumps and you'll start to see and understand that this was a great opportunity for Entertech to expand beyond geothermal and water source heat pump, and let's head toward electrification. And I know John is gonna spend a lot more time on that with us today, but uh, certainly having NEBA help and assist and influence is allowing us to be where we are today, along with our phenomenal engineering team. So very excited, but they motivated us to, to start to begin to diversify, heading towards sustainability. And as you look across this world right now, you see an awful lot about decarbonization, 
more gas moratoriums and things like that that John will continue on. But you'll also see that Entertech started to head towards solar PV and we offer that as a distributed product. And then along with that again was the advancement now of our just released Advantage air to water product. So very excited about this. So you start to see that Entertech is always gonna be geothermally focused, but we're gonna to continue to expand and diversify to really help where the market belongs. Here's just a snapshot real quick, if we may, of our Greenville, Illinois location. Super excited about this location. Again, this was the, the beginnings, if you will, of Entertech. And uh, you'll see an awful lot of solar PV, both on the ground and on the roof. There's about 550 kilowatt of uh, solar PV there, which is generating about 97% of all the kilowatt hour usage that we need over the course of the year. So again, we are going to live by that mantra where energy meets technology, and we're gonna to continue to lead the way with electrification. So that there generates about 700,000 kilowatt hours for us. Mitchell, South Dakota, as I said, back in 2007, uh, Entertech began manufacturing our own geothermal equipment. This is also, where the air to water, the Advantage heat pump will be coming out of. Phenomenal staff there, you know, led by Dan Jackson and our, our VP of engineering and uh, also VP of production. Dan and his team do a beautiful job. Quality is always first, it always will be. And again, the air to water product will be coming out of Mitchell, South Dakota as well. That expanded from about 20,000 square feet to 80,000 square feet so that we have lots of room to produce high efficient equipment. So without further ado, John, again, welcome. It's a blessing to have you here and it's gonna be exciting to have you for four weeks in a row. So John, please take us through an overview of where this new emerging technology is right now. Thank you, John. Yeah, well, thank you, Tim, uh, and great to be here. Uh, this is a subject that uh, I'd say Tim and I are both very excited about it. Um, I've been advocating for air to water heat pumps uh, in combination with hydronic systems for uh, a number of years now. And it is, uh, it is exciting to watch what is currently a fairly small sector of the heat pump market in North America uh, start to get more interest, start to see products getting into the market. And uh, again, as Tim was mentioning, as, as we see uh, North America moving towards decarbonization, and we're we're seeing a strong emphasis on electricity. Um, I feel that uh, the uh, heat pump market, uh, uh, specifically uh, geothermal water to water, as well as the air to water product we'll be talking about today, uh, those are really going to be the heating and cooling sources for many future hydronic systems. Uh, both residential and commercial scale systems. So it's, it's really a merger of two technologies that offer some uh, very, very good possibilities. So we're gonna talk a little bit about why it makes sense to combine hydronics technology, modern hydronics technology with heat pumps. And now we're gonna move to the very basic uh, refrigeration cycle that's at work in an air to water heat pump. If you're familiar with other types of heat pumps, I'm sure you'll see that Although there are some differences, uh, the, the fundamental concept of a, of a refrigeration loop, a vapor compression cycle that is present in just about any other type of heat pump is, is present here too. Uh, and then we'll look at some hardware configurations. There are different types of, of hardware that are used in the overall market for air to water. Um, and uh, we'll show you where the Entertech product kind of fits into that picture. Uh, we'll talk about heating and cooling performance. Uh, one of the things that's really important with any heat pump is to recognize that the heating performance, the cooling performance, and what we refer to as coefficient of performance, the efficiency of the heat pump, very dependent on how you apply it. And if you do a good job and you merge this with a low temperature distribution system, you respect the operating uh, envelope of that heat pump, you're gonna get some really good performance. And I'd say the inverse is true as well. So what we don't want you to do is go out and say, this is just a box like a boiler 
and all I have to do is cut the old boiler out and drop this in place. Uh, you may get lucky and, and have reasonable performance, but um, trust me, there are uh, situations where people simply don't understand how a heat pump works and where where it's happy, where its thermal performance is going to be good. And if you respect that, you're going to have really good uh, performance. And we're also going to look at several trends in the market that point to growth for air to water heat pumps in North America. Um, possible applications, I'm gonna just kind of whet your appetite for next week. I'll show you, uh, as we get towards the end today, I'll show you a configuration where we could do uh, space uh, heating as well as domestic hot water with the uh, Entertech Advantage product. And then we'll talk a little bit about what's coming up uh, next Tuesday and beyond. So. That's kind of the overview of what we're gonna be doing today. So let's talk about the combination, again, of hydronics and heat pumps. Well, I'm gonna start with a very basic, uh, water versus air, okay? And I put down, it's hardly fair. And I'll, I'll try to build a pretty strong case for hydronics here today. When we move heating through a building with air, we're using a device like this, a squirrel cage blower. And we're moving that air through devices like this. And I, I kind of purposely picked this uh, photograph. Uh, you're, you're looking at flex duct here and you see some really long zip ties here holding it up. But in the foreground, you see some copper piping. And it's pretty obvious that piping is a much smaller diameter than that ducting. But I, I will tell you, and you'll see why this is true shortly, that that piping, piping could probably carry a higher rate of heat transport than that ducting. And you, you might wonder, how is that even possible? Okay. Now, when we go over to hydronics, we can use much smaller, much lower power consuming devices. Here's a, a modern, small, uh, variable speed circulator. This has a permanent magnet motor in it. At full power, this circulator draws approximately 40 watts. And we can move water through much smaller conduits. I'll use that word conduit as kind of a generic term as any kind of a closed container that we're gonna move a fluid through. And what you're looking at here, you're looking at the uh, upward at the underside of a floor deck in a house, and you'll see this black uh, material here. And if I showed that to a person on the street and I say, well, what do you think that, that black material is? They might say, well, it looks like wire. You know, they're used to seeing wire run through holes in floor joists or maybe stapled to the side of the floor joist. Well, that's half inch uh, PEX, PEX aluminum PEX tubing. It's small and it's flexible. And the concept that you can run this small diameter tubing through floor joists and along floor joists, and you can do this with minimal disruption of the structure of the building. That is a big advantage to hydronics. We aren't taking a sawzall and cutting half of the joist away just so we could accommodate, let's say a duct in there. And you might say, well, that piping looks pretty small. How much heat can you really move through piping like that? Uh, I think you'll be surprised. And let's let's get into kind of the, the chemistry, I guess you'd call it, of water versus air. So what you're looking at here is a table of some common materials over here on the left. And I've put down three specific properties of those materials, physical properties. One I'm sure most of you've heard of is called specific heat. It's simply how many BTUs it takes to raise a pound of that material by one degree Fahrenheit. And for water, it's, it's one. One BTU raises one pound of water, one degree Fahrenheit. And you can see some of the other materials here have uh, lower specific heats, okay? Now the next column is density. Density is the number of pounds that a cubic foot of the material would weigh. And water weighs around 62 pounds. Uh, uh, some of you are probably saying, well, yeah, that varies with temperature and you're correct, it does. But nominal 60 degree water weighs about 62 pounds per cubic foot. Um, obviously concrete, most concrete is heavier than that, okay? And again, you'll see some other materials here with density. Now, here's the important part, if you multiply specific heat times density, you get another property called heat capacity. And what heat capacity is, is the number of BTUs that it takes to raise a cubic foot of the material one degree Fahrenheit. 
So it's different from specific heat. Specific heat is based on weight of the material. Heat capacity is based on volume. So if we look at the heat capacity of water, well, specific heat of one times 62.4, okay? So we've got heat capacity, 62.4 BTUs to raise cubic foot of water one degree Fahrenheit. Now let's compare that to air. Air has roughly a quarter of the specific heat of water, but where air loses out is in density. Air is a very low density material. So when we multiply these two numbers together, we get this 0 0.018. So what does it mean? It means that it takes 18 thousandths of one BTU to raise a cubic foot of water one degree Fahrenheit. So when we do a comparison, one of the things I like to do is a ratio. Let's divide the heat capacity of water by the heat capacity of air. And when we do that, we get this number down here, 3467. And I'll just kind of round that off to 3,500. And what these numbers are telling us is that a given volume of water can absorb about 3,500 times more heat than the same volume of air. And fundamentally, that's why we can use much smaller piping compared to ducting. So what I did is a, a comparison where I took some you know, typical design guidelines for a forced air system, let's say a trunk duct. And I believe this was based on uh, about 70,000 BTUs per hour of heat transfer. So using standard guidelines, we'd size that up. And if you go with a rectangular duct, it would be 14 inches wide, eight inches tall. And just uh, to show you something you should not do, I, I made kind of a scale drawing of a two by 12 floor deck. So we're using some two by 12 joists here. And of course we could take a saw and we could cut a nice big notch out of that floor uh, joist. And maybe the client tells us, well, I don't wanna see any ducting. So you have to hide the ducting, get it out of sight. Well, I'm, I'm sure everybody watching would realize here that this is going to destroy the structural integrity of that joist. Perhaps some of you have been in basements and looked up and seen examples of what I call sawzall surgery, where somebody has taken a really large hack out of a, a floor joist or maybe even a support girder. Now let's contrast that. We can move the same amount of heat, again, using standard flow rate limitations and temperature changes in the water, we could move that same amount of heat through a three quarter inch tube. Could be a copper tube, it could be a PEX tube, but we could saw or drill, let's say a one inch hole through the center of that joist, virtually no effect on the structure. So uh, we could say that installing smaller diameter tubing compared to ducting is certainly much less invasive to the structure. Uh, that's true both in new applications, new systems, and certainly true in retrofit applications, okay? Now, another strength of hydronics, if you think about renewable energy, there's a lot of different heat sources that, that use one form or another of renewable energy. And when you look at how these perform, and I'll, I'll just turn the rest of the slide on here so you can see some other sources. Now, in the middle, we've got the air to water heat pump, and we've got an example down here. This is a, uh, a um, Entertech uh, two-stage water-to-water -water geothermal heat pump. And both of those heat pumps are renewable sources. They're both gathering up heat that is available in the environment, either in the outside air or perhaps in, in um, an earth loop. Over on the left, we've got some solar thermal collectors. Over on the right, a couple examples of biomass boilers. This is a cordwood gasification boiler. And over here on the far right is a pellet fueled boiler. So we've got these renewable resources uh, for heat. And hydronics is really what is supporting the use of these heat sources. And the point I wanna really drive home to you is that regardless of which of these renewable heat sources you want to work with, if the balance of the system, which wouldn't be the distribution, the heat emitters, the controls, and so forth, if the balance of the system isn't designed to respect the operating characteristics of these heat sources, you're going to be disappointed in how they perform. And again, over the years that I've been involved with hydronics, I've seen, unfortunately, too many cases of this where 
somebody uh, really is enamored with one of these renewable sources and they assume that they can simply stick it into a house that has whatever for a distribution system and somehow magically it's going to adapt to the pre-existing conditions in that building and, and work well. And that's just not the case. And, and a quick uh, story that I'll, I'll share with you. Um, imagine that you're gonna get involved with NASCAR racing. And here's the plan. And, and let's say this is my plan, okay? I'm gonna go to Italy and I'm gonna buy a Ferrari racing engine. I've actually had an opportunity to see one of these and they're half a million dollars, beautiful piece of hardware. I'm gonna bring the Ferrari, Ferrari racing engine back and I'm gonna install it in my Cub Cadet lawn tractor. And I'm gonna put it on a trailer and take that off to the next NASCAR race. And hopefully some of you are chuckling a little bit at this point because you realize that that Ferrari engine is, is way too much power. It's not properly matched to the drivetrain and the, the balance of system, I'll say. And obviously that's not gonna make a good racing vehicle. Well, think about that from the standpoint of a heat pump. If we take a potentially high performance heat pump and we saddle it with a poorly designed balance of system, we're just not going to get the optimal performance from that. Okay. Now, what are, again, why, why hydronics? Why should you take a look at hydronics if you want to use renewable sources? I always want to start with this, unsurpassed comfort. The reason hydronics technology is used is for achieving unsurpassed comfort. Uh, I'm sure many of you have been in buildings with well-designed hydronic systems, perhaps radiant panel systems, and it's just elegant comfort. You don't feel drafts, you don't hear noise, um, your feet are, are nice and comfortable. So never lose sight of the unsurpassed comfort. Again, we've seen examples in the past where people will put in some type of renewable source and they'll simply tolerate wide swings in temperature and so forth. And uh, they, they kind of sacrifice comfort with the idea that they're, you know, they're making use of this renewable uh, resource. And I'll contend that the mass market will not accept that. They will not accept compromises in comfort simply to use a renewable energy source. So always keep the comfort that you can achieve with properly designed, properly installed hydronics front uh, in front of your clients. Now, it's easy to adapt it to any of those renewable sources we looked at, water-based heat sources, obviously flow naturally into hydronic systems. Uh, there are plenty of approaches that use low water temperature, which is going to definitely improve performance on heat pumps, as well as most of those other renewable sources. The, a key idea with using hydronics and renewables is to keep the water temperature as low as practical. Um, here's one some of you may never have heard of, a concept called distribution efficiency. Now, of course, pretty much everybody watching this webinar probably hears the word efficiency every day. And oftentimes we're talking about the efficiency of a heat source, be it a heat pump, a boiler, okay? And uh, obviously we, we know high efficiency heat sources are good, okay? But have you thought about the efficiency of moving heat from where it's produced to where it's needed in the building? How much wattage is required to move heat from, let's say, a mechanical room in a basement up to you know, the farthest bedroom in, in the house. Well, I'll show you a, a comparison, again, of distribution efficiency uh, of a forced air system to a hydronic system. Uh, thermal storage, we already talked about how good water is at absorbing heat. Some of our systems can use buffer tanks where we may operate a heat pump, maintain a buffer tank within a certain temperature range, and then simply draw from that buffer tank. Think of it like a battery, where the heat pump in effect is charging our battery, our thermal battery, and then we're drawing from that battery. And what that does is allows us to do very small zones. If we want to put a very small towel warmer in a bedroom, I'm sorry, in a bathroom, and it only needs a thousand BTUs per hour, we can do that without short cycling the heat pump. So thermal storage worked into these systems uh, very easy. Um, we're not putting a lot of refrigerant inside a building. In fact, the 
uh, advantage unit, all the refrigerant stays in the outdoor unit. If you've worked with VRF systems, variable refrigerant flow systems, there can be in, in commercial applications, there can be hundreds of pounds of refrigerant in those systems and a potential leak can, can lose a lot of that refrigerant inside the building, not a good situation. Uh, we're going to instead keep that refrigerant contained, a small amount of refrigerant contained within the heat pump, and we're only gonna use water or a water-based antifreeze fluid within the building. Um, it's certainly easy to integrate auxiliary heat sources. Uh, you may be applying these heat pumps. In fact, I, I suspect many of you will be applying these heat pumps in retrofit applications where there's already a boiler in the house. It, it might be a fuel oil, a fired boiler. It might be propane or natural gas. And uh, we're going to talk about the how do you integrate the air to water heat pump into a system that has an existing heat source. And again, it's, it's a fairly easy thing to do. Uh, it's very easy to reduce uh, the loads in buildings by using zoning. Hydronic based zoning can be implemented several different ways, fairly low cost ways compared to uh, forced air zoning. And uh, in some areas, you can reduce the temperature and reduce the energy use. And then one other thing I, I really uh, Again, I'm excited about this technology. Thermal metering, or what sometimes is called heat metering or BTU metering, the idea of centralizing heat production in a building. And think about a commercial building or perhaps an apartment building, condominium building, where instead of putting separate units into each of those uh, apartments, let's say, we're going to centralize heat production. We're going to design a distribution system that would take that heat to each of these apartments, but we're also going to keep track of how much heat goes to each apartment and actually bill the family that lives in that apartment based on how much energy they use, just like we could do with electricity. And there is now an ASTM standard. It took several years to get this uh, in place in North in the United States, but there is an ASTM standard that uh, sets the minimum um, accuracy for this type of equipment. Several manufacturers offer it. So it opens up another opportunity to uh, watch energy use. And, and this does tend to encourage energy conservation. When, when energy is perceived to be free, people waste it. Anything that's free can be wasted with you know, really no consequences. But obviously energy is not free. So by keeping track of this energy flow, it, in, it encourages people to use it wisely. So you can see there's quite a few um, benefits to bringing together hydronics with renewables and specifically we're going to drill down into heat pumps okay so um earlier i mentioned distribution efficiency so what is it well any efficiency is some desired output divided by a necessary input and again we hear this word every day we can apply it to a lot of different things so let's apply it to a distribution system, okay? It could be a hydronic distribution system. It could be a forced air distribution system. So distribution efficiency is going to be the rate of heat delivery by that system divided by the rate of energy use by the distribution equipment. So we're not looking at the heat source here. The heat source is irrelevant to this definition. We're looking at the rate of heat delivery, and we're looking at specifically the power, the electrical power that it takes to make that delivery. So let's do an example. Let's take a system, a fairly high BTU per hour here, but 120,000 BTUs per hour. And let's assume that we've got four small uh, zone circulators and they're operating at 85 watts each. And I will tell you today, you can get zone circulators that will do this at half of that wattage. So this is this is assuming kind of the, the older type of circulator with a permanent split capacitor motor. But doing the math is easy here. We take the rate of heat delivery, and this would be at design load, 120,000 BTUs per hour, and we're dividing it by four times 85, 340 watts. And we come up with this number, 353 BTUs per hour per watt. And you're probably looking at that thinking, what, is, what does that mean? Well, one of the ways you can interpret that is just put a one here in front of watt and say it this way for each watt of electrical power that the distribution system requires it is delivering 
353 BTUs per hour from where it was produced to where it's needed in the building. And now I'm going to ask you, is that good or is that bad? Okay. Well, it's hard to know because you don't have anything to compare it to. It's, it's like uh, if I said um, I could sell you a car that gets 135 miles per gallon. You'd probably say, well, that's fantastic. In fact, it's unbelievable <laughs> because you have some frame of reference on that. If I told you I could sell you a boiler that has 60% combustion efficiency, you would probably look and say, well, that's terrible. You know, boilers today can be upwards of 90% efficient. You have a frame of reference. So let's put a frame of reference here. Let's think about a furnace. This is nothing special. This is a standard furnace with a, a standard permanent split capacitor motor on the blower. And that when that blower's on, it's drawing 850 watts. And that furnace is delivering 80,000 BTUs per hour. So again, we've got all we need for the numbers, 80,000 BTUs per hour divided by 850 watts gives us 94 BTUs per hour being delivered per watt. So now you've got two numbers. You can make a comparison. And in this case, and I want to stress, these numbers are not meant to represent the entire hydronics approach versus the entire forced air approach. They're just two specific examples. But in this example, the hydronic system is delivering almost four times more energy to where it's needed in the building per watt of electrical power input. So again, when we talk about system efficiency, certainly the efficiency of the heat source is important, but it's not the, it's not the sole determination of system efficiency. We should also be looking at the amount of electrical power that it takes to move heating and cooling uh, through the building. And again, why is this possible? Simply going back to that heat capacity of water versus air. Water is, is far better material at absorbing heat and carrying it along through piping uh, to where it's needed. And I won't bore you with a lot of calculations, but we've done calculations and this is a, a simple system. We've got a buffer tank. This could be heated by a heat pump. Um, we've got a small pressure regulated circulator like this, okay, state of the art circulator. And we're going to a manifold and that manifold goes out to uh, several circuits with half inch PEX tubing. And we're going to assume eight individual circuits going out to eight of these panel radiators. And these panel radiators are a modern version of what some of you probably know, cast iron radiators. These are made out of steel. Uh, they're much, uh, uh, much lighter, much lower water content, much faster response. And uh, one of the ways that we can distribute heat from a heat pump is to go out to panel radiators like this. And these are nominally two feet high, six feet long, and we've got eight of them there. And we're going to assume, just to keep the calculation simple, that each of them requires 120 feet of half inch PEX. That would be this tubing here between the radiator and the manifold. So say 60 feet out, 60 feet back. Well, if you run the numbers on this, and, and I should mention, by the way, some of you might be saying, well, that's a pretty big radiator. Well, yeah, it's big because we're assuming 110 degree average water temperature. So we're sizing that radiator for conditions that would allow an air to water heat pump to operate under very favorable COPs. Uh, if we go to higher water temperatures, we, we can reduce the size of the radiator. But fundamentally, there, there's always going to be that trade off that we'll have between the water temperature we want our system to work at and how big our heat emitters have to be. Now, I'll summarize. We could use this system to deliver around 30,000 BTUs per hour using only 8.6 watts of circulator input power. Okay, that is off the shelf available technology today. It's not what we can do five years from now. You could go out today and buy the technology to do that. So let's look at the distribution efficiency. We're delivering actually a little more than 30,000. If you actually look at the total output of eight of those radiators under those conditions, we're delivering about 30,800 BTUs per hour using 8.6 watts. So we're at, uh, we're approaching 3,600 for a distribution efficiency. So let's make a quick comparison. Here's the furnace. Remember we did that calculation. 
80,000 divided by 850, and we got 94 BTUs per hour being delivered per watt of electrical input. And we'll just compare it to what we just talked about, where our distribution efficiency is 3581. So again, let's do a ratio. We'll divide the 94 by the 3581. So look at the implication here. The implication of, again, these two specific systems being compared. We're delivering heat with that modern hydronic system using 2.6% of the electrical energy that the forced air furnace required. And again, I wanna stress, this is not about the efficiency of generating heat. It's about the efficiency of moving heat through the building. So we can be much, much lower in terms of our electrical power requirement when we use a hydronic system to deliver heat through a building. And I feel that's very important moving forward. Uh, you know, again, uh, many incentive programs today uh, focus on the heat source efficiency, be it a boiler or be it a heat pump. We want to look at total overall system efficiency, and hydronics really uh, makes a significant impact on what that overall system efficiency is. Okay, now let's move on. We'll talk about the basic refrigeration cycle in an air to water heat pump. And here it is uh, just a generic air to water heat pump operating in heating mode. So we, we have an outdoor unit and we're bringing outside air in. And of course, this air could be quite cool in the winter time. It, it could actually be below zero degree Fahrenheit air. And we're blowing it past our evaporator coil. The evaporator coil has refrigerant that is changing from a liquid to a vapor. It's absorbing that low grade heat. And if we follow it back in, we come back down through our reversing valve and go into our compressor down here. Compressor is going to compress that vapor refrigerant, bring up its pressure, certainly bring up its temperature. It's going to discharge the high pressure, high temperature gas. It'll do a little U-turn here through the reversing valve and go into our condenser. Now, in a air to water heat pump, the condenser is a water-cooled heat exchanger. It's using water to absorb heat from that refrigerant, causing it to condense back into a liquid. And that water stream is then carrying that heat back into the building. And then finally, uh, our uh, last component in the refrigeration system would be either a thermal expansion valve or today an electronic expansion valve is being used in, in many modern heat pumps. It's our throttling device to bring that liquid refrigerant to a lower pressure and uh, send that back up to the evaporator to start the cycle over. So fundamentally, an air to water heat pump is using the same basic four components that any vapor compression system uses, the evaporator, the condenser, the compressor, and the reversing valve. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, in the cooling mode, we have the same hardware, but the reversing valve effectively changes the function of the uh, air to refrigerant coil at the top of the unit. It is now the condenser and the refrigerant to water coil down in the unit, this becomes the evaporator. So down here, we're, um, we're vaporizing the refrigerant, drawing heat away from a stream of water. That cool water goes back into the building for operating a cooling distribution system. And we're rejecting the heat up here at the top. So again, very similar in, in terms of concept to what uh, any modern vapor compression heat pump is. Uh, I just drew it out here so you could see uh, the evaporator uh, in the heating mode would be your refrigerant to air coil, and then your condenser would be, it, it's some type of a heat exchanger. It could be a brace plate, uh, stainless steel heat exchanger. Uh, other heat pumps may use a shell and tube or a shell and coil type heat exchanger, but fundamentally it's the heat exchanger taking heat from the hot refrigerant, putting it into a stream of water. And then again, when the reversing valve changes position, uh, that flat plate heat exchanger becomes the evaporator rather than the condenser, and we're rejecting heat to the outside. Okay, now let's talk about what, what, do, what are the different configurations of air to water heat pumps. One of the common configurations is called a monoblock, and I sometimes use the term self-contained. When you buy this unit, it is factory charged. The refrigerant is in it 
and that refrigerant stays in it. It does not go outside of that cabinet. It's designed to go outdoors. Typically, it'll be installed fairly close to the building. And you've got a couple pipes that go from that unit. You can see them in the background here through a couple holes in the wall and uh, goes into the balance of the system. Now, with a monoblock in, a, in most climates in North America, even, even including Southern climates, uh, obviously if we have water in an outdoor unit and we get sustained temperatures well below freezing, we run the risk of, of freezing that water and damaging the hardware. So in most North American climates, possibly Key West, maybe I could do an exception down there, but even, even in Texas, you know, I've watched this winter, it's been snowing in Texas. And, you know, when it does, maybe the power goes out for two or three days. And if it's just water in that outdoor unit, you could potentially freeze it. So most manufacturers want to see some type of an antifreeze, typically uh, a non-toxic antifreeze like propylene glycol, depending on the location. Uh, if it's, uh, you know, uh, mid-America, it might be a 25% solution. If it's uh, Moose Jaw, Alaska, it's probably going to be a 40%, maybe even a 50% solution. So we're essentially setting up the entire system to operate with a propylene glycol antifree solution. Another alternative is to use a heat exchanger and set the glycol a portion of the system between the heat exchanger and the heat pump and then use water on the other side. Um, I've seen it done both ways. I, I do tend to favor this. I'm not a huge fan of antifreeze. Uh, those of you that have worked with it know that it's uh, it's slippery, it's expensive, it adds viscosity and so forth. It's, it's not the utopian fluid, but I, I'll summarize it this way. The only good thing about antifreeze is it doesn't freeze. So we need it in these systems in just about any North American application. Now you might say, well, why do you want to put antifreeze in a whole system? Why not just use this heat exchanger? Well, the heat exchanger definitely adds cost and it, it causes performance differences. When you put a heat exchanger between a heat source and a load, there has to be a temperature difference across that heat exchanger to drive heat through it. And ultimately what that does is forces the heat pump to operate at higher fluid temperatures. And as you'll see, higher fluid temperatures tend to bring down <laughs> Got a little background noise going on here. There we go. All right. Now, the other style, uh, another common style of air to water heat pumps is called a split system. And here we're, ha we're using a refrigerant line set, just like we'd use with a unitary air conditioning system. We have an outdoor unit and we have an indoor unit. And that indoor unit is about the size of a small ModCon boiler. Typically it hangs on the wall and we're gonna get a refrigerant line set and run it between them. So what a split system does is it eliminates any water or antifreeze in the system. You, you don't need it because there's no water outside. Now that's, that's a positive, but it also brings in the need to do on-site uh, charging of that unit. Now, I shouldn't say it that way. It, it needs to have some HVAC refrigeration uh, attention. Uh, you have to install the line set, you have to pressure test the line set, you have to um, um, actually open some service valves, uh, I'm sorry, pull a vacuum first and open the service valves. Usually these units come with the refrigerant up to a, a certain length of line set, maybe 30, 35 feet of line set, there's enough refrigerant in the outdoor unit. And once you have the line set installed, pressure tested, vacuum, you can uh, open a couple service valves and let that refrigerant go. And then the unit's ready to, to operate. So over here on the right, here's our refrigerant going in our line set and um, our indoor unit. And then some of the indoor units have circulators built into them. Some of them do not. But basically the indoor unit is the point at which we're gonna pick up heat and move it to the balance of the system. Okay, so, so far we've talked about monoblocks and we've talked about split systems. Um, the Entertech unit is what I refer to as an enhanced monoblock. It is a split system in the sense that there is an outdoor unit and an indoor unit, but this is not refrigeration tubing. 
This is going to have an antifreeze solution in it. So again, all the refrigeration is contained in the outdoor unit, pre-charged, sealed up. Um, from an installer standpoint, it's going to be piping that comes in the building into the indoor unit. The indoor unit, uh, we can send that heat off to uh, a space heating load, a cooling load, or a high performance indirect water heater. What, what I call a reverse indirect, where we, we're sending hot antifreeze, again, non-toxic propylene glycol, it's gonna go through the shell of that tank, domestic water is gonna go through those copper coils, and that's how we're going to heat the water. So again, there's a photo of the um, Advantage unit outside, it's on a stand here, get it up above snow level, all right? And then here's the indoor unit. Uh, again, it's roughly the size of a ModCon boiler, and you can see some piping connected to it. So again, enhanced monoblock um, design. So we're gonna do a poll question now. I'm gonna let uh, Carly run the poll. We just wanna find out, uh, you folks that are on the webinar today, what, you know, what is your background? Have you already installed an air to water heat pump system? So Carly's okay, gonna everyone. run that. If you guys go to your control panel and under polls, I have launched the poll. You guys can go ahead and select the answer. And these answers come back pretty fast. So uh, in just a short time here, Carly's gonna close that. So again, have you had any experience with air to water heat pumps? They have been on a North American market in limited supply for several years. Uh, not a big segment of the market at, at present, but uh, some of you may have worked with them. So Carly, okay. what do we uh, what do we see yep. in here? I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll. Um, it shows that 18% has said yes, 44% said no, and 39% said not yet, but I'm interested in doing so. Great. Well, that that's that's probably a good indication. In fact, uh, I'm I'm pleased to hear that uh, was it 14% have had some uh, experience with this already. Okay, so we'll go on here. Heating and cooling performance. Now, again, uh, many familiar with the, the basic uh, function of a refrigeration system and how we gauge uh, the heating performance of that with any type of a heat pump. We're using an index called coefficient of performance or COP. And if we look at the energy flows involved in a very simplistic model here, we have the free energy, low grade heat that we're absorbing in the case of an air to water from, from outside air, we're adding some more energy in form of electricity to run that compressor. So these are both inputs and basic thermodynamics, the two inputs have to add up to the output under steady state conditions. So our output here, uh, Q3, that becomes the uh, numerator in this fraction and we're dividing by the electrical input. So we're looking at a ratio that is telling us how much total heat we're sending to the load divided by how much electrical energy it takes to run this heat pump, at least the, the compressor of the heat pump. And the higher that ratio is, the better, uh, the better our unit is performing because the higher the COP is, the more heat per watt of electrical input power. Now, basic, again, heat pump thermodynamics, when we look at what a heat pump is doing, fundamentally, it's taking low temperature heat, in this case from outside air, and it's moving that heat, or what I call lifting that heat to a higher temperature. And in the case of an air to water heat pump, putting that heat into water at that higher temperature. So think about what the heat pump is doing is lifting the temperature of that heat. And anything that reduces the extent of that temperature lift improves the performance of the heat pump. Now, obviously we can't control the temperature of the outside air, but we do have some control over the temperature of the water that that heat goes into. Specifically, we control that by the design of our hydronic distribution system. If we try to ask a heat pump to produce 180 degree water because our baseboard in the house has it, we're, we're just not gonna get there. And the lower we can bring that water temperature down, the higher the COP is going to be. So that, that's a good 
practical way to think about COP or perhaps explain that to your client. What we're trying to do in designing this system is to minimize that temperature lift to get good performance. Now, I'll just show a couple curves here. Uh, the curves over on the left, these are generic curves. Um, many air to water heat pumps today that are uh, either referred to as cold climate or low ambient, uh, they can actually operate at conditions pretty similar to this. And what we're looking at is heating output here, BTUs per hour. And we're looking at that plotted against outdoor temperature. And we're also looking at it plotted against three different leaving water temperatures. This would be the temperature of the water or water antifreeze solution that's leaving the condenser of the heat pump. And one of the things you can see is that the highest curve here, the blue curve, is when we're leaving the condenser, in this case, at 95 degrees. You might be thinking, well, what can I do with 95 degree water? That's like bathtub temperature water. There are uh, several types of radiant panel heating that can actually operate at those temperatures, even on a cold day. Okay, A bare slab with fairly closely spaced tubing, good insulation, relatively low load per square foot in the building, 95 degree fluid would do it. Now, there are you know, certainly systems that need higher temperature fluids. So we've got two other curves here, one plotted at 113 and one at 131. And you can see heating capacity does drop off as we go to those higher temperature fluids. Not a lot, but it, it does drop. And the other thing you can see as we vary from basically the 60s outside where very few buildings need heat down to minus 10, we get a huge range of heating capacity. Okay, so we can't really point to a heat pump and say, that's a four ton heat pump, therefore it puts out 48,000 BTUs per hour. That's not the case. It can put out 48,000 BTUs per hour, perhaps at some reference outdoor condition and some corresponding leaving water temperature. But if we vary either of those, we're, we're going to get a variation in heating capacity. And it's a similar story with coefficient of performance. The lower we can keep the water temperature, the higher the COPs are going to be for any given outdoor temperature. All right. So again, these are generic curves. Let's look at some specific curves, in this case, for the five-ton rated, a nominal five-ton rated uh, advantage heat pump. And again, you get specific curves here for three different water temperatures. And you'll see the lower temperature, the water uh, that's at lower temperature produces a higher heating capacity. And eventually all three of these curves kind of come together. And we were talking about this earlier uh, this morning. This is a firmware control in the unit that is protecting the compressor against uh, specific temperature and pressure limitations. So we, we don't want to allow a heat pump to operate in conditions that would put a undue strain on the unit. So this unit has the intelligence to know when the compressor needs to limit itself. And that's why those three curves uh, basically come together like that. But again, strong function of outdoor temperature. You will see that this unit can actually operate right down to uh, a minus 13 degree Fahrenheit outdoor temperature. Uh, even where I live in upstate New York, that's that's a rare occurrence. And when it does occur, it's only there for uh, perhaps a few hours. OK, so again, it's it's about temperature lift. Anything we can do from our system design to minimize our temperature lift is going to push us up in terms of our heating capacity. COPs are uh, very similar to what we looked at here. Uh, if we look at roughly zero degrees here and leaving water temperature of about 113, you can see we're actually up a little bit, well, maybe at about 2.4 COP. It's actually a really good performance. Uh, that's at a, a low ambient, zero degree outdoor condition, producing 113 degree fluid. Uh, there, are, again, are many types of hydronic systems that could meet a building's design load with that temperature, okay? So again, temperature lift. Now, cooling performance. Again, it's really about temperature lift, but in this case, it's from the chilled water temperature that we are producing to cool our building up to whatever the current outdoor temperature is that we're dissipating heat to. Uh, obviously, we don't control the outdoor temperature, but 
within limits, we can control chill water temperature. Uh, the, the big thing with chill water temperature and cooling is to make sure that you do proper latent cooling. Latent cooling basically refers to moisture removal. So by using air handlers that have deep multi-tube pass coils, we can actually do a, a better job of bringing moisture out of the air. And we can actually run chill water temperatures a little higher than what you might be thinking, you know, in, easily in a range of 50, 55 degrees Fahrenheit and still do adequate dehumidification. So if we can run a air to water heat pump and produce 55 degree chill water versus 45 degree chill water, we're going to get better what's called energy efficiency ratios. And again, um, I won't spend a lot of time on it. The, the bottom line here, the warmer the chilled water can be, that I know that sounds like an oxymoron, but the warmer the chilled water can be and still satisfy both sensible and latent cooling loads, the better the performance of the heat pump, both in terms of its cooling capacity and, if you will, the cooling equivalent of COP energy efficiency ratio. Okay. Now, we've talked, we've talked a bit about hydronics. We've talked a bit about uh, fundamentally what the heat pump does. So let's talk about the market. Why is the North American market poised for strong growth in air to water heat pumps? All right. So I'm gonna start with a look at the global market. Uh, there's an interesting publication. I actually didn't know this publication was around. I, I happened to come across it a few years ago at one of the AHR shows. And it's, it's published in Japan, it's called JARN. And if you're used to the, the news, the um, air conditioning, heating and refrigeration news, this is sort of the Japanese equivalent. So it comes out, I believe it comes out every uh, month and they also have a website. But one of the things that JARN does is they keep track of the air to water heat pump market. They, they keep track of several markets, but air to water heat pumps. And um, back in July of last year, uh, they reported about 3.4 million air to water heat pumps used globally. And the annualized growth rate that that represented over the previous year was almost 26%. And China is a huge market for this technology. There were about 2 million of these units installed in China. And roughly 600,000 of these units went into the European market. And that was led by France. Uh, many of you know France is heavily invested in electric, electrical energy distribution. And the other uh, countries, Germany, Italy, UK was also a pretty strong market and a growing market for air to water. Uh, many of these were installed as part of decarbonization plans uh, run by these countries, okay, phasing out uh, gas-fired boilers as well as oil-fired boilers. And the manufacturers, uh, I'm sure you recognize many of those names. Uh, many of the companies that currently sell ductless mini-split heat pumps in North America have air-to-water heat pump products. They just have not put those products into the North American market, at, at least at this point. So, um, you know, why am I showing you different names here? I just want to show you there's a lot of manufacturers and there's a, actually a lot of, of this product being used uh, globally. And there's several manufacturers, uh, again, up in the Canadian market. So uh, let's look at North America. One of the things that is a, a very strong growth market in North America right now is net zero buildings, both residential buildings and commercial buildings. And a typical net zero house has a low loss thermal envelope. So it's well insulated, it's well air sealed. And the way to get to net zero is basically with solar photovoltaics. So what we're doing either on the building or on site or as part of a community solar project, uh, we're trying to produce, to, to be truly net zero, we're producing as much energy as the building is using over the course of a year, okay? And this relies on what are called net metering laws. And net metering laws are many different utilities that have this. Um, net metering is essentially the idea that if I generate a kilowatt hour on my rooftop solar array, I can send that kilowatt hour back through the utility meter and it will, in effect, run the meter backwards and give me full credit. In other words, 
the utility will in effect pay me the same amount for that kilowatt hour that it would charge me when I pull it back from the utility to the building. And think about that. That's like using the utility as, from a practical standpoint, an infinite, free, and 100% efficient battery, okay? Where we could send kilowatt hours back out onto that grid when we have a surplus. It could be a sunny day in the, in the summer or the spring, the fall, where we, we don't have a strong heating load or cooling load. We may not have either load. Yet our PV system is producing and we're sending that energy back out. And in effect, that utility is going to store that energy for us at no cost. And we can draw it back perhaps on a cold winter night when we want to run that heat pump and produce some heat with it. So you look at some of the statistics here. The U.S. market is growing very, very rapidly. The Canadian market is actually even outstripping the, the U.S. market. So the definite trend with net zero is towards all electric buildings. So uh, heat pumps certainly fit in with the concept of a growing net zero market, okay? Now, another thing that's happening is decreasing heating loads. If we go back, you know, I've, I've been doing hydronic systems now for over 40 years, and I can easily remember when we had houses with design heating loads of about 30 BTUs per hour per square foot of floor area, and we used to think, well, that, you know, that's reasonable. Today, that would be considered excessive. Uh, today, many houses are being built, and they may have design loads in the range of about 10 BTUs per hour per square foot. There's been some uh, so-called passive buildings that are significantly less than 10, uh, but then there's some others that might be up perhaps 15. But the bottom line is it's, it's a lot less than it used to be. So imagine an 1,800 square foot house that only has an 18,000 BTU per hour design day heating load. Go find a boiler that can do that. Well, I've actually looked at some boilers in our market now, and one of the smaller models at full output is 51,000. Uh, in theory, it can modulate back to about 7,700 BTUs per hour. But we're still looking at minimum modulation here. We're still not looking at the ability to to really throttle down to what a part load day might require. So uh, it's, it's harder to match boilers to very low heating loads in buildings. Uh, that's not the case with, with heat pumps, okay? Now, another thing to consider is, uh, you know, many houses, of course, today in suburban America where natural gas service is available, they'll have a gas meter and they're paying a monthly service charge. And I just, I brought up here a, one bill, an invoice, just to show um, in this particular utility was charging $20 per month for basically having the gas meter on the building. So you can think of it as rental on the gas meter. Well, imagine we got the heating load very, very low. It's conceivable that the price we're paying for the actual gas that we're using is less than what we're paying on it, at least on an annual basis for the um, meter on the building. And the other thing, and you can see here that this particular utility is using a sliding scale on the gas prices. So basically the more you use, the less expensive it gets. So again, if you have a building with a low demand, you're actually paying a little bit more per therm for that gas. So if we go to an all electric building, we eliminate the gas meter. We eliminate, in this case, it would be what, um, $240 a year plus tax for the privilege of having the gas meter on the building. And certainly that could be applied towards the, uh, the heat pump system. Okay. Now, I, I don't want to be too hard on fossil fuels uh, from the standpoint, they've been used for a long time. And considering that there are hundreds of millions of uh, installations, you know, they've actually got a reasonable track record, but things can go wrong with fossil fuels. Obviously, you have, whenever you have combustion, one of the byproducts is carbon monoxide. And people have died from carbon monoxide produced by boilers and furnaces. Um, with improper application, here's an example. This happens to be a, a copper tube heat exchanger out of a boiler. 
and you might say, well, I, you know, whose boiler is that? Well, I'm not going to tell you because it isn't the manufacturer's fault. That's a really bad application where whoever put that boiler in allowed sustained flue gas condensation to basically scale up the heat exchanger to the point of a flame rollout. Uh, in the middle here, this is a, think of that as a fuel oil tank that's being taken out of service. If that leaks, it's going to cost that homeowner several thousands of dollars. Uh, uh, the environmental agencies are going to get involved. Uh, they take it very seriously. You do not want to have fuel oil leaking either in the ground or inside a building. And over here on the far right, again, this is due to poor application, not poor product. Uh, you'll see corrosion. That, that vent connector comes from an oil-fired boiler that's only been in service for about six months, and yet there's corrosion eating right through that vent connector. Why'd that happen? Because that boiler was connected to a, a low temperature floor heating system and there was no provision to protect it against sustained flue gas condensation. Well, with a heat pump, you don't have any of these issues. There is no com combustion. So we don't have to deal with venting or toxic gases or uh, flue gases that are, are corroding our system, okay? Now, one of the other things that is happening as, as we speak, uh, there are utilities that are faced with a dilemma. Uh, going, rolling the clock back at least a couple decades now, many of these utilities, and I'll use downstate New York, down in Westchester County as a good example. Uh, the utilities were heavily promoting converting from fuel oil, which had a, a pretty well-established market in, in downstate, down near New York City, uh, converting from fuel oil over into natural gas. They're really pushing that. And so what happened is a lot of people made that conversion, and now what they're finding is that their distribution system is like maxed out. And they are putting moratoriums on extending natural gas service. So if you're a builder, a developer down in that area, you can't get natural gas, again, I, I think it's a great opportunity for heat pumps to to you know take over where natural gas would be kind of in the past kind of a default for those kind of projects and we're seeing this happen in other areas um again out west uh seattle i know vancouver is uh either at a moratorium stage or uh soon will be at a point where uh, they are eventually going to eliminate natural gas they're working hard towards moving the market towards electrification and, and away from any type of fossil fuel and again you may be thinking you know those are kind of some extreme conditions but i do think you will see this trend continue probably around major urban areas um it, again it, it is likely to continue and this is going to push the market towards electrification and if you want to read about this um, you can actually download this publication over here on the right here's a website this was a, uh, a study done by the Clean Energy States Alliance. And what they did is they looked at all the different states that have uh, plans for decarbonization. Moving forward, what are their goals? For example, New York State. Um, New York State, let's see, is that on there? I, I know New York State is moving towards 100% renewable electricity. I believe it's by 2040. So a little less than 20 years, imagine 100% of the electricity in New York State. Um, you know, I don't know whether they'll attain that goal, but I can assure you that there will be many um, factors that are going to shape the market towards attainment of that goal. Uh, uh, incentives that are going to promote heat pumps of all types. So one of the things I did, I just I just took a couple pages out of this report. And if you look there, you'll see I've highlighted the word electricity. The bottom line is most of these state energy plans are definitely moving towards electrification and away from fossil fuels. And so I put down the operative word here is electricity. And where you see electricity, the next logical thing to think about is heat pumps. Okay. Now, here's another interesting trend. Uh, we talk about how space heating loads are getting smaller but people still want to take baths and take showers and it's interesting that if you look at domestic water heating as a percentage of the total thermal energy load in a building where we're looking at both domestic water heating and space heating as the total load 
Uh, the domestic water, in some cases, represents 25 to 30 percent of that total load. All right. So if we were heating domestic water with a standard electric water heater, or it could be a tankless electric water heater, the bottom line is anytime you're using a resistance heating element to heat water, the COP is one. One kilowatt hour in gives you 3,413 BTUs out, and there's no way around it. That's fundamental thermodynamics, okay? On top of that, some of the ductless mini splits that go in today, uh, most of them do not have the capability of heating domestic hot water, okay? And um, another thing, and I, I don't have a slide on this, but I'll mention it. Uh, some of you might be thinking, well, what about a house that might have a ductless mini split system in it for space heating, and then we install a heat pump water heater within the thermal envelope of that house? Um, I just did a column in, in Plumbing and Mechanical Magazine, it'll actually be uh, coming out soon, and it, it shows you that the net effect of basically putting two heat pumps in a, in a cascading arrangement like that um, lowers what the effective COP would be. Now, um, I did do an example here, and I'll, I'll just kind of uh, summarize it. What I did is I compared using a heat pump, and I'm assuming that the annual COP of the heat pump, remember a domestic water load is an annual load, so we're taking advantage of the high ambient temperatures in the summer as well as uh, you know, lower COPs in the winter. So let's assume on average we're doing 2.5 as our seasonal, you know, our annual COP, and let's compare that to electric resistance heating for a load of 60 gallons per day of domestic hot water, uh, the temperature rise of the water is from 50 to 120 degrees Fahrenheit. We're going to assume that's in a location where electrical energy is 12 cents a kilowatt hour. If you do the math on that, uh, the heat pump is going to save about $270 a year over that electric water heater just on the domestic water load. So that's that's pretty significant. And the uh, the Advantage heat pump does have a dedicated domestic water capability in it. Uh, it has uh, the intelligence to know when that domestic water tank needs heat and will switch the load over to do that. So it can do that in both heating mode as, as well as in cooling mode. So domestic water heating uh, being done by a heat pump compared to just a standard electric resistance heating scenario does represent a, a good significant savings. Now, I mentioned I've been in hydronics for 40 years and I've seen a lot of this. And I summarize it that boilers don't offer cooling. Uh, oftentimes we'll get people that are excited about hydronic heating. You know, perhaps they've been in a building with radiant floor heating and they love it from a comfort standpoint. They're excited about it. And then the question comes up, but what do I do about cooling? And in the past, the answers have typically been, well, You'll, you know, here's a, here's a company I know of, they install air conditioning systems, talk to them. In other words, get another contractor involved, put a whole separate system in the building to do cooling. And, and that can be expensive. And, and oftentimes it's, quite honestly, it's a turnoff for that prospective customer. They don't necessarily want to spend that much money to put two completely separate systems in, one for heating and one for cooling. So now with heat pumps, we have the ability to do cooling chilled water cooling. We could run chilled water from the heat pump to an air handler and we could do a, a, a ducted system through the building or we could run chilled water to console air handlers, fan coil units that have drip pans. We could do zoned chilled water cooling within the building. So again, the flexibility of hydronics allows us to do chilled water cooling in, in different approaches depending on what the requirements of the project are. And I stress, you know, as a contractor, why give away that potentially profitable business to a separate contractor, tool up, learn heat pumps, and learn how to do chilled water cooling. And, you know, now you're a, a one-stop shop for heating, cooling, and domestic hot water. And again, there are several different ways. One of the newest ways, not widely known yet, but radiant panel cooling. Uh, so especially in commercial structures. And I, I don't want to get off on a tangent on that, but I will stress to you that that is a market to watch, especially in, in commercial segment, radiant panel cooling. 
Now, another thing, and this is our kind of our final point on trending here. Um, air to water heat pumps back in 2019 were given an award from the uh, EPA as an emerging technology. What, what does that mean? It, it means that the EPA is seeing the potential here. Um, and, and I do think this will eventually lead to, again, uh, legitimacy of the market, um, as well as per perhaps this may become the basis of some rebate programs. Uh, they, they do have some performance, uh, suggested performance requirements that, again, the, the uh, Anatech unit easily meets those requirements. And the other thing, uh, one of the states that has really stepped out and taken a lead with air to water heat pumps is Vermont. Uh, they have a thousand dollar per ton rebate, and this is actually a listing. Several different manufacturers are recognized, including Entertech, with both the two and a half ton and the five ton unit. So again, you can see a thousand dollars per ton over here. Uh, great incentive, uh, and th there may be other incentive programs in the in the works uh, as this technology becomes more understood in terms of how it can perform and, and how does it fit into the North American market. So hopefully there, we've looked at a lot of different trends and I see these trends basically coming together and certainly pointing to heat pumps as a kind of a macroscopic picture. But when we look at bringing hydronics and heat pumps together, certainly geothermal is, is viable, has been used for several years. We've designed, my, my company has designed several geo water to water systems with hydronic delivery and they work great. Uh, not every project can take a geothermal heat pump. It could be land limited, so forth. So again, it's not about all air to water, it's about widening your offerings. If you're doing geothermal now, take a good look at air to water. It's, it's simply another tool in your toolbox to meet specific requirements on a project. Okay, so we're gonna do another poll question. I'm gonna turn it back over to uh, Carly. She's gonna run the poll. And um, are you considering adding air to water heat pumps to your system offerings? So Carly, I'm gonna let the you run has, that. Okay, the poll has been launched. I, I guess you would say I have been a little bit biased leading up to this question, so. Um, again, we're trying to justify it, not just simply say, you know, you should take a look at this. Uh, we're trying to justify what, what is coming together and not only thinking about it, um, you know, five years from now, 10 years from now, these, these market factors are at work today. And uh, I think uh, we're probably going to see acceleration of these trends that is definitely going to, to push the heat pump market forward. So. Okay, there you go. There are the results. Um, you um, can see I, that 81% say yes, 3% say no, and then 17% say maybe. Great. Good potential out there. All right. Well, we're, we're getting closer. I'm going to try to uh, wrap this up pretty quick, but you know, I've mentioned ductless mini split heat pumps, and today that there these are prolific. There are, gosh, at least a couple dozen companies that offer these products in North America. Um, they are plug and play in a sense. They're, they're um, you know, you put the indoor unit in, you put the outdoor unit in, you run a line set and, and so forth. But, you know, they also have some limitations. So we wanna, let's talk about them. One of the things that I've observed over probably the last several years is that the folks that are doing net zero, the architects, the builders, the people that are doing the training, they really kind of default to ductless mini split heat pumps. And they'll, they'll say something like, this is all you need to know about heating and cooling a net zero house. Just put in a ductless mini split heat pump. And uh, you know that that's really about saying, all right, a ductless mini split heat pump can put BTUs into a building or in cooling, take BTUs out of a building. True, does it create good comfort? Is it, you know, the optimal approach. And over here on the far right, you can see, I actually found this article, came across this article, and there's a website that you can look this up on, Pro, Pro Trade Craft. We've got a lot of interesting articles, but somebody did an article entitled Nine Ways to Hide a Mini Split. And it put a couple of them in here where they, 
They basically built a cabinet with a grill, put it over the front of the mini split. Well, yeah, that, that does hide the unit. What does that do to the airflow? What does that do to the serviceability of that unit? Uh, sometimes architects may not be as cognizant of the need for the service and the accessibility there. Uh, down below, they built a cavity here in the wall and put it in there. So yeah, you can get creative and you can, you can try to hide these units. But um, if you do something like that, you wanna make sure that you uh, are not interfering with airflow. Now, one of the suggestions that you'll hear in some of these training programs with Net Zero is basically put one or two of these indoor wall cassette units in, like you see in the photo here, and uh, run the line sets, the outdoor unit, and then just leave all the doors open in the house. And the rationale here is that since we have a tight building envelope and a high R values in the walls and the windows and so forth, that the air will tend to equalize within the building if you leave the doors open. That's partially true, but it's not a complete solution. Um, yes, the tighter the thermal envelope is relative to uninsulated interior partitions, the, the temperatures will tend to come closer to each other, but you're also going to find that, that is, that's not going to give you perfect uniform temperature. So I actually took this off a website uh, verbatim. Leave bedroom doors open during the day. If you want to heat your house with a ductless mini split located in the living room or hallway, you'll need to leave your bedroom doors open during the day. When the bedroom doors are closed at night, bedroom temperatures may drop five degrees between bedtime and morning. Some people could certainly handle that. Other people, no, I, I don't want that. I, you know, maybe I want to sleep with a warm bedroom. And then down below, if family members don't want to abide by this approach or don't want to accept occasional low bedroom temperatures during winter, then supplemental electric resistance heaters should be installed in the bedrooms. Now I'll ask a question, is that a compromise in comfort? And I'll let you answer it uh, however you'd like, okay? I think it is. And the other thing that I want to point out is that the ductless mini split market oftentimes will emphasize their ability to maintain pretty good capacity right down to, and in some cases, slightly below zero degree outdoor temperatures. And they do that by speeding up the compressor, but it is much harder to find the coefficient of performance data for a ductless mini split at sub-zero temperatures. So I just, I plotted out some data here. Um, this graph up here, shows one of the units and uh, you can see right down to just above zero, uh, they're maintaining 100% capacity and then they're dropping off a little bit as they go down towards minus 13. But you, uh, you can try this on your own. Uh, just go to any website and do some search of technical literature and look for sub-zero ambient COP data on these. Um, in many cases, you're gonna find it's very difficult to find it. There actually was a study that was done a few years ago, five years ago up in Vermont on uh, ductless mini splits. And they, they installed these systems and they monitored the performance uh, with good instrumentation. And I just picked a couple sites here. Uh, in this particular site, uh, at zero degrees outside, their COP was 1.1. Now that's 10% above electric resistance heat. You can see the COPs were going up as they went up in ambient temperature. But you know, perhaps with an advertised COP up in here, this is what they're attaining. A uh, little better performance at this site here, they, they were getting about 1.8 at a zero degree ambient, okay? Again, if you go back and look at the performance curves on the uh, Entertech unit, uh, well above both of these. So uh, again, I'll, I'll just leave it. Ductless mini splits, uh, I don't think they're gonna go away because they are a convenient solution but I do want to stress there's a difference between supplying BTUs to a space versus supplying comfort, okay? So a few uh, photographs that show that here, all right? They rely on forced air delivery, and generally for cooling, that's not a problem. It actually feels pretty good. But one of the, one of the issues that some of these studies on ductless mini splits have picked up is stratification, especially in spaces that have tall ceilings, uh, warm air tends to rise towards the ceiling, cooler air tends to go to the floor. Now, again, you might say the average temperature at the thermostat level is 
you know, 68 to 70 degrees. But again, look at how does that affect human comfort? You know, there, there's quite, there's a lot of information out there on the, the physiology of human thermal comfort. Um, if you want to take a good look at some information, uh, there's a website called healthyheating.com. It's all one word, healthyheating.com. It's run by a, a colleague of mine, Robert Bean. He has done a very deep dive into the relationship between human thermal comfort and um, excuse me, human thermal comfort and hydronics. Now, uh, one of the other things that I find annoying, um, annoying with ductless mini splits is when they go into a defrost cycle and any air source heat pump in a heating mode in a cool climate is going to go into defrost. But when a ductless mini split goes into defrost, the energy that it takes to melt the frost on the coil comes from inside air. That's the only place it can get it. So basically, you're putting the heat pump into cooling mode and you're dumping, you're taking heat from inside air and you're putting it into the outdoor coil to melt the frost. Now, that may only go on for five minutes or 10 minutes, but during that time, that indoor unit is going to be blowing cool air into the space. And it could be, you know, a day in the middle of January when it's zero degrees outside. That is a huge compromise in comfort. Now, how does an air to water heat pump differ from that? The heat that it takes to defrost that coil is going to come out of a buffer tank. Okay. And that, that buffer tank is, again, think of it as a battery for BTUs. Um, I've actually got an air to water heat pump in, a, in my office and radiant floor heating. And I can tell you when that unit goes into defrost, there's absolutely no indication, no compromise of comfort. The energy comes out of the buffer tank, it quickly melts the frost, and then the unit goes back into heating. So the thermal mass of the hydronic system, uh, both at the buffer tank as, as well as uh, in the slab itself, is the moderator that provides that defrost energy, and it does not compromise comfort. Okay. Okay. So let's uh, let's go on here. Uh, again, I I put down ductless mini splits are. I, I summarize it, BTUs delivered. If you think about the, the house as a box, an insulated box, we're putting BTUs in at the same rate that the BTUs are leaking out. Thermodynamically, we're accomplishing what we need to. We're balancing heat loss with heat input, thermodynamically. Question is, are we creating comfort in the process? Okay, hydronics can do a lot more for you. So beyond, Ductless mini splits, we can do um, certainly easy room by room zoning. Uh, we have both radiant and convective heat delivery. Uh, what you're looking at down here is a um, infrared thermography of a radiant ceiling. Over here is a panel radiator. Okay. Uh, we could do zone cooling. We can do domestic water heating. Uh, we have the potential with a heat exchanger to take the uh, heat output from the heat pump in summer and put it into a pool, okay? Uh, we've talked about high distribution efficiency. Actually, uh, the efficiency of moving heat through a building with refrigerant is even lower than with forced air, okay? Uh, you can argue, oh, well, there's no pump. Well, yeah, but you're pumping refrigerant with a compressor and it takes, it takes uh, significant energy to move that refrigerant uh, at a speed that will bring oil back to the compressor and so forth. So, and we also, we don't have, um, in the case of a monoblock or an enhanced monoblock, we don't have any refrigerant in the building, okay? And that brings us up our final poll question. Uh, we've been talking quite a bit about how the performance of a heat pump is optimized when we go to low temperature hydronic heating systems. So we're just curious, uh, the folks that are watching today, does your company work with low temperature hydronic heating systems? Uh, again, that's that could be floor heating, it could be radiant walls, radiant ceilings, it could be possibly uh, properly sized panel radiators or properly sized fan coil units. Think about water temperatures of 120 degrees Fahrenheit or lower. Does your company work with those types of systems? So Carly, I'm gonna let, uh, let you run that and see uh, what we find. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll.
and share the results so we can see that 72% said yes, 18% said no, and 10% said not yet. Okay. So again, there's there's a market poised for uh, adaptation of air to water heat pumps. If you're already working with low temperature hydronic systems, you've you've kind of got the balance of system part down. And what we'll be doing uh, as we go forward, we're going to get into some of the nuts and bolts details of how you can all take that existing knowledge of that low temperature distribution system and apply it towards an air to water heat pump. So. I, I'm just going to give you a quick uh, teaser for where we're going to be going next week and beyond. I put together a simple schematic, a very basic schematic here uh, of the Entertech Advantage heat pump. Here's our outdoor unit. Remember, all the refrigeration is in the outdoor unit. And then we've got our antifreeze solution coming to the indoor unit. You can see we've got piping that goes off to the right here into a High, uh, high performance indirect water heater where we have a lot of internal heat exchanger area. So we don't have to force that heat pump to go into really high temperatures for domestic hot water. And then over on the left, we've got a hydraulic separator. I'm sure some of you have used these components. If you've never heard of a hydraulic separator, uh, basically what it does is it separates the pressure dynamics of the circulator over here on the distribution system from the pressure dynamics of an internal circulator that is built into the indoor unit of the Advantage heat pump. We don't want those circulators to fight each other or interfere with each other. And a hydraulic separator does that, and it also does air removal. So if you use a hydraulic separator, you don't need a separate air, um, air elimination device. And it also does dirt removal. And some of these today actually have magnets in them that can do uh, magnetic particle separation. I really recommend those if you're working with high efficiency circulators with permanent magnet rotors uh, to keep the water nice and clean. We don't, we don't want uh, any magnetic particles in the system. And then finally, we've got a variable speed pressure regulated circulator. We'll talk about these more next week. There's a, a lot of them on the market. And that's going to a distribution system that includes uh, zone valves that can open and close based on thermostat calls. I'm showing radiant panels. This could be floor heating, wall heating, ceiling heating, combination. And I'm also showing in the summer, here's a air handler with chill water coil in it. And uh, that, that could be a single zone cooling. So again, we're doing space heating, we're doing cooling, and we're doing domestic hot water, very basic, straightforward setup and uh, again we're going to look at a lot of variations as we go forward with the uh, the next three sessions all right so next week we're going to get into details what are some system design details i've hopefully uh, whetted your appetite you know low water temperature is important uh, so are details like what we just talked about the uh, hydraulic separation and so forth uh, that'll be next tuesday at nine o'clock central time um, and then after that, retrofitting. We, we feel that that is a strong segment of this market, uh, especially as policies go forward that limit the use of fossil fuels, in some cases even eliminate the use of fossil fuels. What do tens of thousands of existing homeowners and building owners do uh, as far as moving a air to water heat pump into a building that has gas-fired boiler, oil-fired boiler, and so forth. And then the last session we're going to do by mid-February, we're going to look at some example systems where we're going to start putting together different types of distribution systems and different types of loads with, with various configurations all built around the capabilities of that Entertech Advantage heat pump. So with that, I'm going to stop and go back over to... Uh, Carly or Tim, if we've got some questions, we've got a few minutes that we can uh, address some questions. Yeah, so I will go ahead and answer, uh, give questions out, Tim, Jeff, and John, whoever wants to answer them, go ahead and go. The first question is from Dennis. Have you ever thought of bringing everything inside with remote indoor coil, like um, some of the other geothermal air to water heat pumps? Um, well, I'll take a quick stab, not not representing uh, Entertech's uh, um, possibilities on this. 
Uh, there are interior air to water heat pumps in some markets right now, primarily in the European market. Uh, it is a, another niche within the market. Um, right now, I'm not familiar with any offering from any manufacturer in North America for an air to water, an interior air to water heat pump. And just in, if you're wondering what is an interior air to water heat pump, essentially you duck the outside air in to the air handling section of the heat pump and then send it back outside again. Um, Tim or Jeff, I don't know if you want to touch on that or say anything. Uh, yeah, this is Jeff. Uh, it's something that we certainly could look at. Um, the mechanical room space is always an issue. Um, you could have some place inside to put it. It's a fairly good sized unit to have that kind of efficiency. Being outside is, um, you know, not going to take any mechanical room space, and it is a monoblock, so it's a package unit. Uh, the only thing inside really are your hydronic components. So, you know, not necessarily a bad idea, but uh, not, you know, not something on the near term horizon anyway. Okay, the next question is when is the ETA for the Advantage Heat, heat Pump? Jim or Jeff? <laughs> I'll take that one, Jeff. Um, the ETA is certainly we would encourage right now from the standpoint of if you go on the Entertech USA site and specifically the Advantage site is there is a 10 part video series that has been put together by Entertech and our technical service and training team. And those 10 videos have to uh, be gone through in a, a brief quiz or summary for each of those and then purchasing is available. Uh, as far as the actual time frame, again, those units are being built and we're looking for mid to late February as far as the actual release time coming out of the factory. So please go ahead and Carly, I know that you will send that along to everybody to make sure that they know where to go specifically on the Advantage and get going on the, the 10 video series. Thank you. Okay, next question. Do you think the air to water heat pumps will start to take the place of air to air in the future? Uh, well, <laughs> uh, let's say uh, for people that have discerning tastes on comfort, I will say yes. And, and the reason I say that, again, hydronics really the, 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 chief, uh, the chief reason that, or primary reason that people look at hydronics is for comfort. So it's it's a multifaceted answer. It depends on the attitude and, and who's making that decision, quite honestly. Um, air to air heat pumps from a builder's perspective are easier and less less complex than dealing with either air to water, geothermal, any any other type. But that builder is not the, you know, it's not the person living with that system. Uh, what I have found over the years with clients that uh, typically would contact me uh, when we were doing system design, many of those people had already done a fair amount of research. They knew they wanted to and they, they wanted it done properly. So uh, again, people that uh, have discerning taste when it comes to comfort uh, are going to gravitate towards hydronics over forced air. And I, I do think that uh, that holds potential for both geothermal water to water as well as uh, air to water heat pumps. Perfect. John, I would just add add to that if I may. Um, certainly in some markets already, Seattle, you know, being one of them right now, in some cases where you're not able to connect to natural gas for hot water, uh, the question has already come in to Entertech is, can I just look at this AV, this Advantage product for my potable water? Uh, they've already got their heating and cooling system figured out. So we're working diligently on that. And you brought it up beautifully, how important domestic hot water is, how expensive it is, and how this can also be attributed to a major benefactor on energy savings, especially again, in heading toward uh, the net zero type construction. Okay, so this is a multi-part question. Um, John, could you talk more about the hydronics use as a cooling source, as well as um, are these viable for cooling dominant areas and what kind of temperatures are you seeing um, with these? Like what, um, 
what kind of cooling temperature outdoors for this unit can you see, can you use with it? Well, the, the unit's rated, uh, I, I don't know the exact number, but it, it's essentially rated for any North American climate uh, as far as what the outdoor temperature limit is. So if it's 100 degrees out, the unit can operate. But it's, it, as we talked about, the performance curves, <clears throat> the higher the ambient temperature, the lower the EER and, and cooling capacity. But that's true with any heat pump, that any air source heat pump. Um, the chill water temperatures, I would say at the minimum, of the low end, 45 degrees, I would encourage designers to look at 50 degree plus, even, even in 55 to 60 degree range, that's going to improve the performance of it. As far as chill water uh, cooling, chill water cooling has been around for decades at commercial buildings. Uh, what is new is using chill water cooling in residential like commercial buildings. So essentially think of that heat pump as your chill water generator. Uh, that chill water could go to a buffer tank. Uh, if you're doing a zoned chill water distribution system, for example, if you're putting four or five console fan coils in, uh, first of all, make sure those fan coils are rated for chill water cooling. They have to have condensate drip pans and drains because you're, you're going to create condensate on the coil. And the other thing I will stress with chill water cooling that some of the, especially the residential hydronic heating contractors may not have had a lot of experience with, it is absolutely critical to insulate any chill water distribution piping or components. Uh, running a copper pipe above a drywall ceiling and trying to run 50 degree chill water through it on a humid August afternoon is, is, is a, really a setup for a problem. You're going to have condensate forming within minutes on that pipe and dripping and, and staining. So if you're going to do chill water cooling, it simply requires that you insulate the distribution piping and make sure you have terminal units, you know, fan coils or air handlers that have drip pans built into them. And, uh, you know, you run that, run those drip pans to proper drains. Okay. Um, the next question is, can this work for pool heat? Yeah, it can. Um, you would need a heat exchanger that you could you could set this up. And in fact, we have some schematics coming up. <clears throat> Excuse me. We have some schematics coming up in these uh, next sessions that show it. Uh, you absolutely have to have a heat exchanger between the heat pump and the pool water. Uh, pool water has high concentrations of chlorine. And typically, the heat exchangers that are used anytime you're transferring heat from a boiler or heat pump to pool water, uh, typically it's a Sheldon tube heat exchanger and it's going to have uh, titanium tubes in it to make sure it, it doesn't corrode from that high chlorinated pool water. Don't run the pool water directly through the heat pump. Okay, and then just wrapping it up, we have one more question. Can this be used for on a can it be used on a high velocity system? Sure. Um, yeah, we, there are high velocity uh, fan coils that could be uh, connected. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The water, the water coil in the high velocity air handler could certainly take the chill water. Uh, really, the difference with a high velocity system is uh, you're, you're using a higher static pressure blower and smaller ducting. So yeah, there. As Jeff was mentioning, there's several manufacturers that make that type of uh, air handler unit and uh, it could be set up to go with uh, chill water coming from the uh, heat pump. Okay and last question um, and I also want to note that if your question was not answered today we will get to it. Um, we'll reach out to you via email or phone call um, and then if you have any other questions after feel free to send us an email and we can get those answered. Okay so la the last question is if the Advantage unit is operating cooling mode how does it provide domestic hot water? Jeff, I'll let you address that one. Sure, yeah, it switches back and forth and you can choose your priorities. Uh, most people will choose hot water as the priority and it ramps up to uh, max speed, 6,500 RPMs to satisfy that tank quickly and then goes back to doing cooling. It will do that in both heating and cooling modes. Uh, so you have two priority settings. Uh, you want hot water to be priority over 
heating and cooling? And then do you want heating to be priority over cooling? In case you have multiple zones and you might have simultaneous uh, heating and cooling calls along with the hot water call. So it's got a lot of flexibility there. Okay, that's all the questions we have today. Um, if you guys have any other questions, like I said, submit them via email. And then we will be sending out a follow-up email with the webinar recording, the presentation, and some other questions that we, we saw come in. So on that note, John, Tim, Jeff, I can pass it over to you guys for some final words. Um, yeah, just to, go ahead, John. Yeah, I just, uh, prob we're probably going to say the same thing. Tune in next week for uh, the next session. We'll get right into the details. Yeah, well said. And thank you, everybody, for taking time today. We do look forward to seeing you online here next Tuesday morning. Thank you very much. And uh, we're excited to dive into the details on system design details for air to water heat pumps. So stay tuned and please continue to invite other colleagues, utility folks, uh, you know, builders, anybody else interested in this wonderful technology. Thank you for your time today. Very much appreciated on behalf of Entertech and John Siegenthaler. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Goodbye.